Father is making a bunch of people sick, that they are healed and are able to do their jobs and do what they need to do, and that your way is done. I pray that the messages upstairs and downstairs affect everyone's hearts and stay with them. And in Jesus' name, amen. Could you show the worship team, the media team, the sound team, the coffee house, the youth leaders, how much you appreciate them, the prayer team, all the above. Is this good? <laughs> Is this a good volume? Can y'all hear me? I said y'all. Can all y'all? I don't know if we have enough people to qualify for all y'all, but okay. No, I am excited to be in the house of God. I am thankful to see so many people. I said, I remember a couple years ago, we had a bunch of people on Wednesday nights. We had a prayer meeting. And then everything shut down, and there was not a lot of people in the house of God. And there were a whole lot of Sunday mornings <laughs> when it was less than 10, six feet away, and staring into a camera. And there was a lot of Sundays where I just prayed. I was like, I am really looking forward to the day when we can get back together and I can look at your face and see everyone smile. And I am thankful that we live in that answered prayer. Amen? Oh, I'm so excited to, to dig into the word tonight. I'm so excited to talk about our topic. It's kind of a unique, interesting chapter. And we're going to be in Joshua 7. So if you'd open up your Bible to Joshua 7... As you do that, I'm going to read a few announcements. Next Saturday, April 30th. Is that this Saturday? Yeah, it's this Saturday. It is next Saturday. Uh, starting at 10 a.m., it's the annual spring cleaning day. As you know, many hands make light work. So if you can come, there's a sign-up sheet out there. Even if you just come just to do a little bit of light work, move some stuff around, encourage people. I know it's work, but it is a lot of fun. Like, when we took down the Christmas decorations, it was only a handful of us, but we laughed and laughed. We also vacuumed and vacuumed, because once garland gets moved around, there's glitter and sparkly dust everywhere. So we laughed, and we vacuumed, and then we vacuumed some more, and then we looked for another vacuum. You guys understand, right? Everyone puts up decorations. So it's a good time. Sign up. Come help clean up the church for spring cleaning next Saturday. Also, ladies, the tickets for the Lifeway Women's Simulcast Conference is being hosted here on Saturday, May 14th. Those tickets are now available. There will be multiple speakers sharing what God has for us and pursuing Christ together in grace. Lunch will be served, and everyone that attends will be entered to win door prizes. Yes. We got some winners in the house. Several people. Yes. So the cost is $25 per ticket. Stop by the information desk to get your tickets today. So that is the announcements for tonight. As I said, we're going to read from Joshua chapter 7. It's kind of an interesting story. And I believe there's some good, solid, foundational truths in this chapter for us. And uh, I wish we could say we planned all the songs perfectly, but sometimes we just pick the songs, right? And then it happens to be exactly perfectly aligned with what God's trying to speak in his words, the songs just match up perfect, right? So he's saying, to you our hearts are open, nothing here is hidden. I pray that that would be the declaration of our hearts tonight, that as we approach God, there's nothing hidden in our midst. There's nothing that we're sweating, worrying about in our lives. Amen? All right, let's pray. Lord, tonight we thank you for your word in the house. God, we thank you that we can join together and fellowship as the body of believers. God, that we can come into your house and be the church. Lord, that we can come together, we can encourage each other, hold each other accountable, 
be there for each other in our hour of need. And Lord, we are thankful that your presence is here in our hearts, in our midst. And God, we pray tonight that our, our hearts would be open to your word, that your word would be open to our hearts and that we could know you better that we could know you more. And I pray that we would all grow in grace and truth. Lord, I am thankful for the truth of your word that as it enters into our life, it is like a sword that can pierce and cut. And Lord, that, that word is not there to hurt us or to wound us. But God, we are thankful that your word is sharp, just like a scalpel to cut off that cancer to cut off everything that's not from you. And Lord, I pray tonight that your word would have its effect in our lives. I pray that my words would be your words. I pray that I would decrease so that you could increase tonight. And God, we thank you that you still speak to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you open up your Bibles to Joshua 7, I'm going to read and as you know, we talked last week. There was a huge victory last week. We talked about Jericho, right? That's the chapter in Joshua where everyone's like, yeah. God just took his fist. He saw the enemy and he went, just smushed him like a little bug. It's like, we love that. We want to shout that. But we're like, let's read that again. Let's just go back and read that chapter again. That was a good one. <laughs> so there's always that big victory where God just shows up in power and authority in our lives. And as you know, sometimes after that happens, we trip up. Anybody ever been there? You're riding high, everything's going great, couldn't be better, and then all of a sudden, boom, you fall flat on your face. Just me? Okay. If that's you at home, just put an amen. We won't know you're talking about this part, but right, that's happened to all of us. Same thing for the children of Israel. They were so in awe of the power of God in their lives. They could see the manifestation and the fulfillment of his promises in operation. Literally, God went to the first biggest, baddest obstacle he could find. And he was like, guess what? We're just going to take care of that right away. It's like, oh, maybe we should have saved the big bad guy for the very end is like the final boss on that level. And God's like, no, we're going to take care of that right away. So it's like, oh, cool. God's just moving in power. That is awesome. Sometimes when we see that those big spiritual battles and victories occur, we can get a little too big for our britches. <laughs> we're going to see that that's kind of what happened to the children of Israel. So that's where we start in verse 1. I'm actually going to go... One verse previous. So Joshua 6, 27, it says, So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout all the country. There's no chapter divisions back then. So it says, The Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout all the country. But, oh boy, there's always a but. It says, But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things. So the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. So it's interesting. There's, in this chapter, the word says they were unfaithful. It says they committed trespass. It says unfaithful. The Hebrew word is ma'al. It's literally the word for adultery. Brutal. Just because they were disobedient. It was something that God considers like adultery. They broke the covenant. I looked up what some of the names mean. So Achan, he's the main figure of this chapter. Achan, his name means trouble. He was literally, he's in trouble. He's a picture of what happens to us sometimes after those big spiritual victories. We get so high we're excited, and then we get ourselves in trouble. And it's interesting. His dad, Carmi, his name means vine dresser. Zimri is God is my protection. Zerah is dawn. And Judah, the tribe that they belong to, is the tribe of praise. It's interesting that as you zoom out, things look better and better, right? We're all the way like, they're the tribe of praise. Those are the praisers, the worshipers. They were the ones sent first into battle. 
right? So he belongs to this exclusive group. Like, yeah, that was us. We were out front. We were the worshipers. It's like that in our lives sometimes where, boy, if you're, if you're standing far away and if you're just looking at the big picture, oh, things look pretty good, don't they? <laughs> but then sometimes you zoom in and the closer you get, you look at the fine details. Ooh, things don't look good. All of a sudden we're going to find some trouble. Has any, anybody ever been house hunting? Okay, I don't know what photographers do to take those pictures of houses. <laughs> but if you've been house hunting, you've, you've seen some of those pictures and you're like, wow, we gotta go check this place out. And you take three steps in and you take three steps back out. And you're like, that camera is a liar, <laughs> right? I don't know what filters, what kind of editings they do on those pictures, but online versus reality. When you get up close in some of those houses and you're looking at it and you're like, oh, that's not even, is that even wood paneling? I don't, what is that? You know, it's like once you get up close in the details, all of a sudden you can start to see some of the trouble. Same thing in the children of Israel, same thing in our life. We can be riding high, spiritual victories, things going well in our life. We lie to each other as Christians all the time, right? People come in, how are you doing? Oh, I'm great. Oh, man, I am blessed. <laughs> And deep down, you're like, I am not blessed. <laughs> I am not great. You know, we say, oh, I'm fine. It's like, I don't know what fine means, but it's not good. You know, we put, we put on a lot of times. But in the reality, it's the truth that sets us free. Amen? So we're going to see this. That these spoils, right, that were supposed to be set apart for God. That was his word. That's what he told them in Joshua 6, 8. And in Deuteronomy 2, verses 34, he said, hey, all the stuff is cursed. But some of it's going to be brought into his house, and that stuff is going to be blessed and used for a purpose. If it's not in his house, it's cursed. So we understand that. It's interesting when they disobeyed and took the things that were supposed to belong in the house of God, and they took them out of the proper context, all of a sudden they're cursed. And those cursed things... Right? It's not just about the things. It was that the things they were doing were done in disobedience. So these things done in disobedience, they weren't necessarily evil things. Right? We talked about that the other week. Is this a good thing or is it a God thing? Sometimes that's in our destiny and life events. Sometimes it's in the physical things. Is this a good thing or is it a God thing? It's so important because when we do those things and we disobey God, it says the anger of the Lord it burned. We have to remember he's a holy God. I know I talked about last week. Sometimes we like to think of God as just this sweet old grandpa just up there in his house puttering around, right? Just handing out candies to his grandkids. It's like, no, he's a holy God. He's the creator of the universe. He is just and he is holy. And that's a great truth. The scary truth, we are not. Right? The sin in our lives, he judges. I don't say that to be ominous, but we have to realize that's the big picture of this thing. God's just not this sweet old guy who's just going to look past his things, the things in our life, just because he doesn't have his glasses. Like Mr. Magoo, he's just going to, oh, I don't, you know, I don't quite see that. <laughs> you know, no, he's the real deal. He is a holy God. Amen? Amen? There's a whole lot in that first verse. It says, verse 2, Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to, I, to Ai, which is beside beth -Avon on the east side of the Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy on the country. So the men went up and spied on Ai. I don't know how to say Ai. -I. If you notice, Joshua's a smart guy. He understands patterns. <laughs> He's thinking, I remember I talked to the guy on top of the hill. He was the commander of the Lord's army. We got the battle plan. Let's use the same battle plan for this one. Unfortunately, it doesn't say, Joshua talked to God, and God said, Fortunately, that's not in here. He takes the same battle plan. He says, all right, we're from Jericho. Let's go over there. Send in the two spies. This all sounds familiar, right? Send in the two spies. Go spy. They go up there and spy. And again, none of this is God said. It's this was man's idea. Verse 3, and they returned to Joshua and said to him, do not let all the people go up. But let about two or 3,000 men go up and attack Ai. Don't worry about all the people there, for the people of Ai are few. Ooh, already, they're underestimating the enemy. Like, man, we don't even need to send everybody. Like, 
Send in, send in just a couple guys just to see what's going on there, and they can handle them. So they're already underestimating their enemy. <laughs> Boy, they went, do you see like the, the switches here? They went from like, oh my gosh, there's giants in the land. Guys, they're huge. Oh my gosh, oh no, oh. And they're all, they're all frantically worried until they get to the land. And then all of a sudden, like, all right, God's with us. They get the victory, and they're like, we're pretty good. Yeah, we don't even need everybody. You guys take a break. Just a couple of us, we're going to go over there and we're going to show the devil, the enemy, we're going to show him what's up, right? <laughs> Again, we can laugh because we've all been like, that was me. Yeah. That was me in the spiritual battles. I, I'm pretty tough stuff now. I know what I'm doing. I've been saved for about 13 minutes. <laughs> I told everyone else they're a sinner and they need to go to church, <laughs> right? We've all been there. Sometimes we ride a little high and, and God is good enough to humble us, <laughs> So this same, this same pattern plays out. So it says, verse 4, So about 3,000 men went up from the people, but they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai struck down about 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them down on the descent. There, therefore the hearts of the people melted and became like water. I, I, I'm not diminishing the loss of life in this, they sent up 3,000 men. A couple of those boys from AI run out the gates. They hit one of them on the head and they, and they hightail it out of there. Boy, do you see the emotional swings that some of these people, hey, we're the army of God and we driven by emotions. Do you see how the swings going on? It's easy, it's easy to look at the story and to, to judge like, oh boy, those inexperienced Israelites. <laughs> And then you, have to, then you have to swallow that, that hard pill, like, do, do we ever do that? Are we ever driven by our emotions in our spiritual life? I know as I'm reading this, I'm going, oh, that's me. Thankfully, one thing I've noticed, what really helps in dealing with your emotions is to be aware of them, not just driven by them. I'm trying to, when I start feeling weird about stuff, or life gets hard, or life gets great, I take stock of that. Okay, I'm feeling good about this. Or, hey, I'm feeling this way about this. And sometimes it's literally just taking one step back and noticing. Because then you can check yourself. It's not like, yeah, I had a bunch of sugar. I'm on a roller coaster. Oh, no, someone was mean to me. Oh, but we're having pizza for dinner. You know? Oh, I'm going to church. Oh, amazing. And then, oh, no, and I got to drive home, and I had to wait at the stoplight forever, and then this guy cut me off. You know, it's like, man, your spiritual life, if it's driven by your emotions is going to be constantly up and down. Victory and loss, victory and loss. A mature disciple of Jesus Christ is not driven by their emotions. Amen. Right? Thankfully, God is good enough to allow us to go through the battles. <laughs> Sometimes we're in the middle of them going, oh God, I wish you'd just get me out of this. And the greatest thing he can do is just let us sit in the fire a little bit. <laughs> no, you'll be all right. <laughs> you'll be fine. Just go through it, right? That's how we develop that maturity. So it finishes and says, therefore the hearts of the people were melted like water. Wow. Verse six, then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. This is, obvious, this is at the time that was a picture of mourning and grieving. Right? So there's this, there's, you, you don't get this if you just read it, but there's this physical geography thing going on. They, they left Bethel, which is, means the house of God, and they go to this place, Beth-Avon, and that means the house of iniquity, and that's where AI is, right? The, some of the things that trip us up is not always just the devil tempting us. Sometimes it's our own iniquity and sin. They leave the house of God, and they go to this place of spiritual battle, and it's because they've fallen into sin, they, they start going on their own. They get arrogant and prideful and they start living their lives and doing these things and it ends up, they fall into sin and the tiniest thing pushes them back. So that's the geography. And then you have to notice, like Joshua realized, like, okay, we did something wrong. I think that's one of the signs of a good leader is to pump the brakes and be like, all right, hold on a second. We did something wrong. And you see in the geography of things, he literally orients himself. It says, he fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord. 
You know, he was looking all on his own. He's looking up at the hill of AI and thinking, oh, they're so small, just send some spies. And he's looking at all the wrong things. And all of a sudden he realized, oh, I messed up. I'm going to look at the ark of God. I'm going to go to the presence of God. I'm going to look at him, not just the next battle, not just what's in front of me, but I'm going to look at him. And then that's what's going to fix things. Notice his posture. He also humbles himself. He's literally throwing dust on his head. That's like a weird thing, right? I don't, know if, I don't know if there's a super spiritual thing, but when you would see somebody to do that, like grab dust out of the ground and throw it on your head, that's a sign of like deep anger and a, you know, like resentment and sorrow and grieving, right? He's grieving because he's like, man, we did this without God. We ran ahead on our own and tried to do a good thing, but it wasn't God's will for us. That's the, that's the word for us. We can't just run around and do things on our own. And if we mess up, we have to be willing to humble ourselves and go into his presence. Amen? Verse 7, it says, And Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. O oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it, and they'll surround us, and they'll cut off your name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? Do you, do you see the, again, I don't know a better word, the swing there? From we're marching around Jericho blowing the trumpet to all of a sudden, oh God, if we would have just thought so small, and if we would have just never have even pursued inheriting your blessings. God, if we would have just been content to live a good, decent, average life on the other side of the river, right? Just because things got hard, all of a sudden he's like, well, maybe I shouldn't have went after the promises of God. Maybe I shouldn't have believed God could do more in my life. We do that, don't we? I do that. You know, sometimes it's easier when pursuing God all the challenges come. It's easier to think, man, I should have just lived an easy, normal life. You know, anybody ever thought that? I know we, none of us, no one in the house, for the record, is agreeing with me. That's just, just me. But, like, sometimes you think, man, I could just been, just worked a normal job, just done whatever. But there's a challenge when you try to live for more. Right? There's a challenge when you say, like, hey, alcoholism ran in my family, and it's running out. We don't do that. Right? Drugs, oh, that, oh, that ran in the poverty, you know, just being abusive, being racist. Well, that ran in the family. But when you stand up and go, not anymore, guess what? There's going to be challenges that come with that. But that's what being a disciple of Jesus Christ is all about when you're saying, I'm not going to put up with average and ordinary. My kids deserve better than that. <laughs> we were talking about that with work. We were getting, getting excited. We, were, we have to want more. You know, why do you want more? We were talking, and it's like, man, I want more for my family. I want more for my kids. They deserve that. So I'm going to stand up and fight for that. I'm going to work hard. You know, I'm not going to punch the clock <laughs> just because it's easy. I'm going to go in there with intention. I'm going to be the best, and I'm going to earn more and strive because that's what my family deserves. That's the, the kind of spiritual legacy they deserve. Amen. I'm preaching, sorry, I'm, I should have been teaching. But you see the big swing, and he's thinking, oh man, God, you just brought us here. You're just going to punish us. Now you're going to abandon us. Oh, God, you're going to look bad. That's <laughs> what he's saying, right? He's like, man, you brought us out, and you brought us this far, and all of a sudden you let us get wiped out. God, that, that's not a good look for you. Just saying. So God, while we're here, could you rescue us? Could you help us out? I, and I absolutely, if you think the Bible's boring, you got to read it, because this is some funny stuff. He goes on this whole tirade, and he's Shakespearean, like, oh, Lord, how could you? And verse 10, so the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? It's like he doesn't comfort him. He's like, get up. What are you doing? And he said, Israel has sinned. And they have transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen 
and they've deceived, and they have also put it amongst their own stuff. And I'm trying not to preach every verse, but you have to notice there's a progression there. Do you see that? Like sin sneaks in, even back in Genesis, when sin first enters in, God says, sin is waiting there like a little creepy thing outside your door trying to sneak in. That's literally the word picture used in Genesis. That's what sin does. Sin is just like, just let in a little bit. And then all of a sudden, you have to keep growing. There's a progression there. Like, ah, we took in some accursed things, and now all of a sudden we're stealing. And then we have to deceive, and we have to lie to cover it up. And then we have to put on this whole performance to make this stolen stuff look like it fits in with our stuff. Like, there's this whole performative element to maintaining and covering sin. It's exhausting, right? But we have to notice that, not just in what they do. How's that in our life, too? It says, 12, therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but they turned their backs before the enemies because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore unless you would destroy the accursed things among me. Notice he's not saying we. He's saying, hey, you did this. You went out and ran it. And that's why you couldn't even stand up before your own enemies. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm not just trying to preach fire and brimstone tonight, but we see that. That's what sin does to us. I remember, so we took financial peace, the Dave Ramsey financial peace course, and uh, it was okay until, like I thought it was okay until you start like listing your debts, which is depressing. <laughs> when you actually get all the details and the numbers written down, you're like, wait, what? <laughs> you know, there's like income, but then sometimes you look at it and it's mostly outgo. And you're like, oh no, that's where all the money's going. Oh, it's me. <laughs> Turns out I'm spending all the money. <laughs> I like to eat out, right? Coffee tastes delicious, right? But financial peace was good until... He goes through all this with you, and then one week, I don't know, like week six, he's like, eventually you've got to get mad at debt. Like, you've got to be like, I'm sick of this. I'm sick of spending all my money and sending it to someone else, right? And it's like, that's what got me. I started looking, like, well, how long is it going to take to pay off this debt? And, it, like, it gets you where you get mad. Like, I'm sick of this, right? I feel like that's the same thing that God wants with us for sin, like, he's not just up there trying to be like, well, you need to be better. Just be holy or shaking his finger. He's like, when you let sin in your life, it affects you. It's not just because God's like, oh, I don't like when you do that. I wished you wouldn't. He's like, hey, when you let sin in your life and you start doing all this stuff and lying and deceiving and building that into your life, and doing, you lose confidence in yourself. You know, so if, if this is hitting you tonight, again, I'm not trying to to preach fire and brimstone and, you know, turn and burn. All that's true. But the truth of God's word is like, man, when you let sin just linger around in your life, it steals your confidence. When the enemy comes at you, you fold. He's like, yeah, I don't have any authority. I don't have any power. And like I said the other week, when people come to you with prayer requests, it's like, am I going to pray in faith or, you know, if you got sin in your life, you go in and you're like, God, I would like to pray for that, but first, I'm sorry, you know, and you got to go through, like it steals your spiritual, your strength, amen? And I am thankful that there is power in the name of Jesus to take that all away. And I love that God's attitude is not just condemnation, he's coaching him, he's caring for him. Stop whining, stop laying down, get up. Stand up against the devil. Stand up against your sin. We got this. There's, there's work to do. Let's get going. <laughs> I like the pump-up coach here. It says, therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies. They turned their backs because they are doomed to destruction. He says, neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed from among you. He gets, it's the ultimatum. Do you want the stuff or do you want God? Because I tell you what, if, you, if you're just going to go for the stuff, the stuff's going to get lame after five minutes. But if you go with God, he's got a lot more stuff. And you're with him. 13, he says, get up. Sanctify the people. Say, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord, your God of Israel. There is an accursed thing in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the curse from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes. 
And it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes shall come according to the families, and the family which the Lord takes shall come by the household, and the household which the Lord takes shall come man by man. Then it shall be that he who is taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. One of the most unfortunate truths of sin is that it doesn't just affect you. We talk about how it affects us and our confidence before God. It affects us and our confidence before our enemies. But it affects our families too. When we live less than we should be, living in the grace of God, we're robbing our family of the potential of who we could be in Christ. Does that make sense to everybody? Like, we live in a reality less than what we should be. When we live in the grace of God, we, we have the opportunity to live to be our fullest potential. Wouldn't we all want to be the best spouse we could be for our significant other? Right? We all want to be the best parent for our kids, the best family member, the best friend. We can't do that to the best of our abilities if we just let that sin hang around. And it, like it says, this scales up. Hey, it affects your family, it affects your tribe, your community, your nation, all this stuff. It has an impact. Verse 16, it says, So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. He brought the clan of Judah, and he took the family of Zarhetus, and he brought the family of Zarhetus man by man, and Zabdi was taken. Then he brought the household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah was taken. Boy, I would not want to be that guy. Can you imagine? They're like, hey, everyone stand up. Someone sinned. We're going to go tribe by tribe, and then we're going to go community by household. <laughs> that had to be the worst feeling ever to sit there just knowing, thinking, like, I hope they don't look under the carpet in my tent, <laughs> you know? That's what sin does to you when, oh, something's going on, and you're just, you know, you're just sitting there like, do you think everyone knows? <laughs> well, the worst part is it doesn't even matter if everyone knows. God knows. <laughs> so it says, now Joshua said to Achan, my son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him. And tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I have done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them, and I took them. And they stoned him with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Then they raised over him a great heap of stones, still there to this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of that place is called the Valley of Achor to this day. That sounds so dark. But you have to understand. This is the reality in which we live. Romans says, the wages of sin is death. Right? Nothing has changed. God still judges sin. But I am thankful it says, when we sin... We have an advocate with the Father. You have to understand this in light of Jesus. That punishment of stoning, pretty brutal. The punishment put on Jesus, much worse. Jesus didn't just get stoned. He was also cut off and separated from his relationship with God, crucified on a cross. We have to understand that, that punishment is still heavy, and Jesus took all of that for us. Isn't, that, isn't God so amazing? You know, someday we're, we're all going to have to stand before Jesus and give an account. I'm thankful that Jesus has taken the punishment, so we're going to answer for what we've done to build the kingdom. But it's a very different than standing before a holy God without Jesus by your side. Amen? So that's the big picture, but let's, I mean, let's get real with this. And I speak from experience. If you have a sin in your life or a struggle in your life, the number one thing you want to do is hide that thing. Right? Deep down, 
in the way back of the tent, dig a hole, hide that thing, cover it with dirt, put a rug over it, put a table over it, <laughs> hope never, no one ever finds that. Amen? Maybe you don't amen that, I don't know. That our instinct is to hide. But you have to understand that mercy and forgiveness, even in this instance, came because of one thing. Confession. It says, confess your sins one to another. Because other people can help you carry your burdens. <laughs> your, your gut's saying, you got to hide this sin. But the Spirit of God is saying, do you want to be free from this? Are you tired of having to put in all this work to hide, to pretend, to cover, to be less than you're supposed to be? Are you tired of that? Good. <laughs> if you confess that, man, you, you are free from that. So that's literally, the wages of sin was still death, but forgiveness came because of confession. It says he confessed everything. So there was still the punishment. But now that we're in Christ, we have that forgiveness. Isn't that good news? And you have to understand, like, I mean, it's easy to be like, oh, Achan shouldn't have done it. But the treasure that he's looking at, uh, it said it's about like a lifetime of wages for a person. I don't even know. Is that like a million bucks? Maybe more. You know, thinking even back then, it's like, you stand with a million bucks right there and, you know, be a 100% person of integrity and not take it? That's the challenge for us, right? It was interesting. They did a psychological study and just asking people, you know, would you do this or wouldn't you do that? And they found out most people don't steal, not because they're people of character and integrity, but they're scared of consequences. <laughs> so it's like, hey, if you could steal and no one would find out, it's like, well, yeah, you take it because <laughs> if no one finds out, it's fine, right? That's the test of if you're a true disciple of Jesus Christ. It's like, am I making this decision? because of who I am in Christ, and that's my character and integrity? Or am I doing it because I don't, I don't think I could get caught, but if I did, it would be bad? Right? That's kind of a heart test in that. So I'm here to tell you, this, sounds, this, this is a tough chapter. It talks about trouble. Achan's name, Achan, it literally means trouble. So we get ourselves into trouble. Sometimes it's after the greatest victories we can experience. But there's a couple principles we can take away. And I just five more minutes of this. This is the takeaways from this. So we can ask. We ask, whose fault is this? And if you're taking notes, you can write this down. These are the questions we ask ourselves. Joshua said, God, why did you bring us out here? God, why did you make this happen? Why did you bring... God, why did you do that to us? God, you don't want to embarrass yourself, so you should probably rescue us. In reality, the reflection question is, who did this? It wasn't... God's fault, it was ours. And also, like, we start hiding things. We have to ask ourselves, am I hiding right now? And this is, this is kind of the, one of those things you ask on, you know, when you're laying in bed late at night. Am I hiding something? Am I trying to pretend to be something? Am I trying to cover something up or make it fit where it's not supposed to be just to make it work? Because I'm hiding, right? And we, we hide we turn our back on God and we try to cover something. That's one of those things, it's like if God seems far away, it's not him who's moved. Right? It's like we moved away, we turned our back on God, we start hiding this stuff, we start manipulating things in our life to cover. Really, it's not God who's abandoned us, it's us who's left him. Remember, and God's mad because he's looking at them. He's like, I'm your God. You're my people. I'm your husband. You're my wife. We have a covenant relationship. If we start hiding things from our spouse, we'd have to question it. Like, you know, like you can text whoever you want, but if I walk in the room and you go, <laughs> you'd be like, what's wrong with you? You know, like that would, if you start trying to hide something, it's like, what's going on? So there's... <laughs> Now, all of a sudden, there's, there's a division in the relationship, right? When we start hiding stuff, it's the same thing with God. And I was thinking about this this morning. You know, are we a good covenant relationship partner with God? It's not good of us to be a good spouse to God, be a good covenant relationship. You know what I'm saying? If we're hiding stuff. 
We can't always just come to him for blessings and victory and say, God, do this stuff, rescue me now. You wouldn't want to look bad. <laughs> so if you could, God, right? Our relationship should be more than that with him. And that steals our confidence when we let that sin in, that division that separates us from God. I read a good quote from A.W. Tozer, like, in this church, we do talk about sin and getting right with God and living holy. We don't look at that and go, oh, that's old school. It's like, no, that's the truth of God's word. So we talk about that in this church. But A.W. Tozer said, he said, we cannot afford to let down our Christian standards just to hold the interest of people who want to go to hell and still belong to a church. Right? So, I mean, we talk about these things not to condemn you, and God has these holiness. He has this standards not to condemn you either. It's because he cares about you and he loves you and he wants you to live a new life in Christ Jesus to get right with him and repent and confess your sins because there's so much freedom in that. Amen? I think our, our response to sin in our life should be like Joshua where we grieve and we repent and get right. But I am thankful. We live in the new covenant. We, like we said, all that punishment stuff, it's the same, but I am thankful that Jesus Christ took all for us, all of that for us. Amen. So would everyone stand? Again, I hope this has helped somebody. When we talk about holiness and getting right with God and coming to the altar, it's not because we want to see like who's been sinning and who's going to go forth. Like quite the opposite. We're all of those slaves who have been freed from sin. And if someone else is walking up front, and I'm not going to ask you to walk up front tonight, but if someone else is walking up to the altar, we're like, I'm going to walk with you. Because I've been there. I know what it's like to carry that burden, and I know what it's like to let go of that burden. And I can tell you, one of the best decisions I ever made in my life was to not hide my sin, but to confess it to someone else, because then you got someone else to carry that burden. So... I'm not, don't say anything out loud right now, but if you've got something going on in your life, if it's a, a sin or something, if your number one thing that you're thinking is like, I can't tell people because, that's probably the reason you need to tell somebody. So I would just encourage you, if you're, you know, a female, to obviously talk to someone more mature in the faith who is female, and to talk with them and say, I, I need some help. I need some counseling. There are people in this church who are qualified counselors who are female who would be happy to talk with you, who can pray with you. <laughs> but you don't have to carry that burden alone by yourself and be like, oh, no, if you only knew. It's like, if, if you only knew, like, how much we've all been there. Same thing with a guy. Like, talk to another guy. Talk to the pastor. <laughs> we are here for you as the body of Christ. We are not here to condemn you. We are all in this together. We are all living testimonies of the goodness of God in our life, of his forgiveness. There's a choice we all have to make. We can live in the fear of worrying that someone's going to find us out. And this is going to sound crazy. Or you can go tell on yourself. If you go tell on yourself, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You don't have to worry about your consequences chasing you down. You can confess your sins, and then you can worry about his goodness and his mercy chasing you down. And that's the best place to be. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you for the truth of your word. God, I thank you for the grace of Jesus Christ in our lives. God, I pray that we would be people who live in repentance and confession of our sin to get it off our chests. God, forgive us for hiding our sins. Lord, like you don't know. God, forgive us for, for trying to hide stuff under the rug. And it just looks silly because there's a big lump under the rug and we're going to pretend like it doesn't exist. God, we know that you know all things. You know our hearts. And God, we know that you know our deepest, darkest sin, our deepest, darkest secret that would make us want to hide. And God, you still love us. You still sent Jesus Christ to redeem us. You have sent your son to give us 
forgiveness so we can repent and confess and get right before you so that we can stand as your people, holy, free from the burden of sin, free from bondage. We don't have to live a lie anymore because we have a life in Jesus Christ. God, I pray that we would have the boldness to confess our sins and to live right before you. God, I pray that if anybody is dealing with that worry and fear and doubt, even if it's not, you know, I'm not just talking about big sin, but if a secret you're living with, God, I pray that you would just put faith in people who may be feeling that to seek you out and to see and just receive the goodness of God. Your word invites us, it says, Come, taste and see that the Lord is good. God, I am so thankful for freedom in Christ Jesus. Lord, we know that after chapter 7 is chapter 8, and there's a great victory coming. God, we know that we sin and we fall down, but you are there to forgive us and pick us up. And God, I thank you that you don't just stand there in condemnation, but you stand there in forgiveness and you tell us to get up, to get right, and start marching. And Lord, we are going to march forward and receive the victory that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So that's all I got for tonight. We will see you Sunday morning, 10 a.m. sharp. Come a little early and get some coffee. Amen. amen. Have a good night, everybody. God bless. Bye.